Welcome back team. We're going to start with general chemistry chapter 3 bonding and chemical interactions. So 3.1 we're going to talk about bonding. Chemical bonds can be ionic or covalent. Elements will form bonds to attain a noble gas-like electron configuration and they follow the octet rules where elements will be most stable with eight valence electrons but there are some exceptions to these uh, rules. So some of them have an incomplete octet, so elements are stable with fewer than eight electrons in their valence shell. This includes hydrogen, which has two, helium, which has two, lithium with two, beryllium with four, and boron with six. So uh, these elements will be most stable with uh, electrons that are less than eight. Some of them, however, have an expanded octet which means that uh, they can hold more than eight electrons. So these are any elements in period three. So this would be phosphorus, um, which has uh, or needs 10 for its octet, uh, sulfur, which needs 12, chlorine, that needs 14, and there are many others, but these are the main ones that you want to uh, be mindful of. And the third exception is the odd number of electrons. So... Any molecule with an odd number of valence electron cannot distribute those electrons to give 8 to each atom. So nitric oxide, NO, has 11 valence electrons, so there's always that one um, that's left by itself. So this uh, subchapter is super important to understand because I have seen it come up in the MCAT before. So just be mindful of these three exceptions and uh, some of the elements that are in these. So we're going to move on to 3.2, which talks about ionic bonds. So ionic bonding is formed via the transfer of one or more electrons from an element with low ionization energy to an element with high electron affinity. Now, if you have issues visualizing that, I suggest you go check out chapter 2, where I summarize that table with the different periodic patterns. So go check that out. But continuing along, um, ionic bonding are ionic compounds that form crystalline lattice structures, and they dissociate in polar solvents like water and have a high melting and boiling point. So just down here, I've given an example of um, an ACL. So you have sodium, which is a metal, and then you have chlorine, which is a non-metal, and together it forms a sodium chloride. So this is a form of a transfer of an electron. They're not necessarily sharing it. It's where sodium has a low ionization energy, so it gives its electron to Cl, which has a high electron affinity. A fun way to know this is that metals lose electrons to become cations. Remember, the T becomes a positive sign, so cations, positive ions. And nonmetals gain to become anions, and the N in the anions is for negative ions. Moving on to 3.3, we're going to look at covalent bonds. So covalent bonding is formed via sharing of electrons between two elements of similar electronegativities. Um, the increase in bond order increases bond strength, energy, and length. So bond order pretty much refers to the number of bonds that there are. So the more bonds that you have, the higher the bond order. So with single bonds, uh, they have the longest length and the weakest strength. Whereas triple bonds have the shortest length, but they have the strongest strength. So when it comes to covalent bonding, the first thing that we look for is to see whether or not the two atoms are of similar electronegativities. If so, we have to then determine whether or not the elements are nonpolar or polar. For nonpolar, both atoms have the same electronegativity and uh, the total electronegativity is less than 0 0.5. And example of that are diatomic atoms. So you have H2, N2, O2, F2, etc. And in the example given here, we have two nonmetals. Um, we have two fluorines, 
As you can see, these two nonmetals will share electrons, will bond together and create nonpolar covalent bonding. For polar covalent, however, there is a significant difference in the electronegativities, where the total electronegativity ranges from 0 0.5 to 1.7, and the electrons are shared unevenly. And to the right, you can see the trend for the electronegativity, where it increases if you go up and increases if you go towards the right of the periodic table. With the example given below, carbon has a higher electronegativity, therefore has a partial negative charge, and hydrogen with the less electronegativity has the partial positive charge. So this element has a dipole. And to draw that dipole, just mash the tail of that dipole to the partial positive end and the head to the negative end. The partial positive acts like the positive sign on the tail, and that's a quick tip on drawing dipoles. Another thing to be mindful of for polar covalent bonding is this equation over here. So we have a lowercase p, which represents a dipole moment, a q, which is the magnitude of the charge, times displacement, which is the vector, and it has di by units, which is coulombs, meters. Next up, we have coordinate covalent bonds which result when a single atom provides both bonding electrons while the other atom does not contribute any. In the example provided, we have a Lewis acid and a Lewis base, where you have the nitrogen with the lone pair of electrons, and it provides both of those electrons to boron so they can combine to create a coordinate covalent bond. Moving on to Lewis dot symbol, these are chemical representation of an atom's valence electrons. And lithium only has one, um, beryllium has two, boron has three, and carbon has four, and etc. etc. These are the steps on how to write with Lewis dot symbols. So step number one, write out the elements. And if you have carbon in the element, carbon is usually in the middle. So with the example, we have HCN, and I've put C in the middle. Step two, count all the valence electrons of the atoms. So we know that hydrogen has one, carbon has four in its valence, and nitrogen has five. And that makes a total of 10 electrons. Step number three, draw single bonds between the central atom and the other atoms surrounding it. So one pair of electrons equals one bond. So that's two electrons. That one pair has two electrons. Just keep that in mind. So for step three, I have H. I have two electrons, so that makes one pair of electron, and that's one bond, one single bond to be exact. And then I have a carbon, and then another two electrons creating one single bond, and then a nitrogen. And then step four. Complete the octets of all atoms bonded to the central atom. So now that we know that each dot represents one electron, and we already have four dots in place from step three, so that's ten electrons minus four, and we're left with six additional electrons to use. Working from left to right, let's look at hydrogen first. So hydrogen can only have two electrons when bonded to another atom, so its octet is already full. Then we move on to carbon that can form four bonds. That means eight electrons. And because the octet for hydrogen is already full, we add these extra electrons between carbon and nitrogen. So we end up adding four more electrons. So that's two pairs of electrons creating a triple bond. And then the remaining two electrons can go on nitrogen lone pairs. And if we were to simplify the Lewis dot symbol, we have to convert each pair of electron into a bond, which means that two electrons create one bond. So the bond between hydrogen and carbon is one, and between carbon and nitrogen is three, because we have two, four, six. Six electrons. Six divided by two is three, so that's three bonds. And we leave the lone pairs as is. And moving on to formal charges, we represent this with Fc, 
is equal to V minus N non-bonding minus half of N bonding. So V is valence electrons, N non-bonding is non-bonding electrons, and N bonding refers to the bonding electrons. Another way uh, that we can write this is Fc is equal to valence electrons minus dots and minus sticks where dots refers to the lone pairs of electrons and sticks refers to the number of bonds in our simplified HCN expression. And below I have two examples. For example, one, we have H single bonded to carbon and then a triple bond to nitrogen with lone pair. So we start by writing all the elements that are given. So we have H, C, and N. And then we know the valence electrons for each, so H will have one, carbon will have four valence electrons, and nitrogen originally has five valence electrons. Then we start with the easiest element, which is hydrogen. So it has zero lone pairs, so we write a zero. And it has one bond, so one stick, and that's the value for one. And one minus zero minus one is equal to zero, so the formal charge will be zero. Moving on to carbon, we already know that it has four valence electrons, so we subtract that with the number of dots, and it has zero valence electrons as well, so we write a zero. And then it has four sticks, one with hydrogen and three with nitrogen, so that's four. So we have four minus zero minus four. Again, that gives us a formal charge of zero. And then moving on to nitrogen, we know that it has five valence electrons minus two because it has two electrons as lone pairs and has three bonds to carbon. So five minus two minus three, again, comes to the formal charge of zero. With the second example, this is another way that we could have written the equation where it's H single bonded to nitrogen, triple bonded to carbon, with a lone pair. So once again, we write out the different elements in the equation. So we have H, C, N. We write out their valence electrons and complete the equations. And the difference in this example is that carbon has a formal charge of negative 1 and nitrogen has a formal charge of positive 1. However, we prefer the latter example, which is example 1 with carbon in the middle because it's the most stable, and we'll talk about that more later on. Moving on to resonance, it represents all the possible configurations of the electrons. So the two examples that we did before, they both had their octets fulfilled, and but there were two different ways, so that's a resonance. So coming down to stable structure, like we talked about before, um, the stable structure is the one with the smallest or no formal charges. And with the example above, the one with the least formal charge was the first example that we did. So that's the one that we should go with. Whereas example number two, with the carbon on the side, had a formal charge of negative one. And then the nitrogen had the formal charge of positive one. So for a stable structure, once again, smallest or no formal charge. Um, number two, less separation between opposite charges. And number three, having the negative formal charge on more electronegative atoms is more stable. Just below here, we have an example where S in the middle is considered to be more stable because there are formal charges on the other resonance structures. Moving on to valence shell electron pair repulsion, also known as Vesper theory. It predicts the three-dimensional molecular geometry and polarity of covalently bonded molecules. So the first thing we want to do is draw the Lewis dot structure of the molecule. Two, count the total number of bonding and non-bonding electrons in the valence shell of the central atoms. And number three, figure out the geometry of the molecule. And then number four, identify its polarity. According to the AAMC's list, draw and identify structural formulas for the molecules provided there. Um, just be able to identify their geometry um, and their polarity in different scenarios. Moving forward to atomic and molecular orbitals. So we have bonding orbitals, 
um, these signs of the two atomic orbitals are the same, and then we have non-bonding orbitals where the signs of the two atomic orbitals are different. So down below we have the pi and the sigma orbitals, and as you can see the pi bonding ones, when they're filled, they're both facing the same way. Same thing with the sigma, they're both facing the same way, whereas non-bonding are opposite. With sigma bonds, orbitals overlap head to head, and pi bonds have orbitals that overlap in such a way that there are two parallel electron cloud densities. The example below shows how to calculate the number of sigma and pi bonds in a given molecule. So the first bond will always be a sigma bond, and any additional bond will be an addition of a pi bond. So a single bond is one sigma, two bonds is one sigma, one pi, and a triple bond is one sigma and the addition of two pi bonds. So the first bond will always be sigma, any addition after that will be an addition to the pi bonds. Then we move on to 3.4, where we talk about intermolecular forces. So the term inter, the T-E-R, intermolecular forces are electrostatic attractions between molecules. And the IF are considered to be less than covalent bonds, which are then considered less than ionic bonds. So the strongest you have are the ionic bonds, second, covalent, third, IF. Now, when you have intramolecular, where it's I-N-T-R-A, um, it occurs between atoms of the same molecule. For example, um, intermolecular forces will occur between a water molecule with another water molecule, whereas intramolecular forces will occur between that one water molecule between oxygen and the hydrogen. So going back to intermolecular forces, we have LDF, which is for London Dispersion Forces. It's one of the weakest interactions but present in all atoms and molecules that are nonpolar. So they increase size of atom or the structure, you increase the London Dispersion Force. And another example of these would be Van der Waals or induced dipoles. With dipole-dipole interactions, um, they occur between oppositely charged ends of polar molecules, so between your partial positives and partial negatives. They are stronger than LDFs, and interactions occur in solid and liquid phases, but not gas phase. So that's a key point there. And hydrogen bonds are your specialized subset of dipole-dipole involved in intra- and intermolecular interactions. And this is when the hydrogen can either bond to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. And the way I remember this is hydrogen has fun. F-O-N. Fun. And that's all for Chapter 3. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you in Chapter 4. Take care.